In season two of the Best of Health podcast, I am shining a spotlight on all of the life stages of women's health, from menarche to postmenopause. Topics covered will range literally from head to toe, addressing migraines to vaginal health and everything in between. My conversations are going to be with leading experts in their field, and we will tap into a deep well of knowledge and uncover an array of clinical pearls, which promise to be an illuminating and helpful support to your personal health journey. So grab a cuppa and join me this autumn for the Best of Health Season 2, Women's Health Uncovered. Welcome back everybody to the Best of Health podcast season two and today I have with me the wonderful Sandra Greenbank and we are going to be talking all about women's health as it pertains to fertility and optimal pregnancy. Um, Sandra is a fellow nutritional therapist. She has uh, 12, 15 years experience in uh, as a nutritional therapist and 12 years very specifically uh, focused if you like with it through the lens of fertility and uh and healthy and healthy pregnancy she trained at the institute of optimal nutrition and then where i met sandra was through the institute of functional medicine and has gone through the whole program and is a fully certified practitioner and sandra mentors and other nutritionists in terms of the through this particular lens and really helps to guide them supporting women like yourselves who are listening who are uh, wanting to really uh, engender and and uh, encourage their health to have the most uh, optimal pregnancy and to feel their their very best and she is a, has a mine of information. So welcome, Sandra. It's such a joy to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm You're excited. Welcome. <laughs> um, so could you just explain a little bit about um, how or what made you sort of most passionate about, sort of, I guess, specialising, focusing on the power of a more connected approach to uh, to fertility and optimal pregnancy. Um, so people ask me, did you have your own fertility problems? And I didn't. Yeah, not not really. I mean, I had a couple of things, obviously, that went on through pregnancy, which you know how nutrition and you know approach approaches help to that. But actually, it started. Um, with my own parents ill health and you know growing up they they had all sorts of health problems and I could see even though I had no training uh, in lifestyle medicine that I could see that the things that they were doing uh, you know smoking two packets a day and very very stressed and you know eating one very large meal uh, you know often after a kind of very stressful shift at work and you know I could I could tell I could see the trajectory and the you know growing up I was thinking I don't you know I can see that they've done it all wrong and how they've ended up and I don't want to end up in that way oh, but interesting it, it, yeah and um, then I had my own kind of epiphany again when I moved to to England from from Sweden where um, you know when you come here the lifestyle is really different and you would eat a sandwich and a packet of crisps at lunchtime which is not what I was used to in Sweden we eat a cooked meal at lunch and um, after work we'd go out have drinks you know a late meal not so much exercise whereas I was you know exercise is kind of part of life in Sweden in a completely different more natural way than what it is here anyway I got a muffin top and I got tired and you know to cut a long story short my doctors just kind of said there's nothing wrong with you. I went to see a nutritionist and she fixed me very quickly. How, um, How old were you when you- I was when... in my 20s. Okay. Was my, but okay. you know, my GP tried to put me on antidepressants because I was complaining about tiredness and I was like, I'm not depressed. And um, it was to do with my gut health. And, you know, once I understood how to eat, and yeah. it, was, it was very simple, you know, it's very simple, but un unless you know it, yeah, you don't know it, do you? So, yeah. you know, it was just going back to how how I grew up, I suppose, but I just hadn't realised that I'd changed necessarily. But um, so then I sort of 
that's how I ended up signing up to studying at the Institute for Optimum Nutrition. I think okay. This was back in 2005 or something. And yep. um, I realized through the studies and, and then also through having my own babies along the way that actually if, if you want to make a big change for somebody, you want to do it before they get ill, right? You, you know, yeah, illness absolutely. begins many, 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 many years before that blood test is positive te- positive or whatever and in fact it begins in childhood but now we understand that it begins at the point of where your egg and the sperm is matured in the three months before conception that is that that is the one time that you have the most um input as opposed to power to change or to affect the trajectory of that future child's health um and uh so I decided I decided that actually family health child health and preconception health was my way of making the biggest impact that I could um because once you know how to eat to prepare for pregnancy you also know how to feed your children and feed yourself and so it it has that ripple effect because the child then goes out and understands how to eat and you know takes that with them I mean there will always be a blip at university generally and you know we don't worry about that but yeah you know we come we do generally come back to how we grew up don't we you know I certainly absolutely and also I really through bringing up my own daughter as well that those it's a fine line isn't it between you don't want to become you don't want to be obsessional um and i always think about that image in um the hugh grant film about a boy with the with the with the mum who sort of the child has never had a mcdonald's or you yeah, know yeah. Is forced to eat sort of <laughs> really really grim sort of very 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 bland food anyway i digress but those um patterns and actually the the they don't develop a taste for those artificial highly mm-hmm. highly sweetened foods um and my daughter certainly i sort of remember really sort of having she didn't develop a a, a sweet tooth for those for, for the really really ultra fake tasting confectionery mm. um even though now she's sort of out of my clutches at 17 <laughs> she's off <laughs> doing what she wants to do yeah, I think that, I mean, my dad is Italian and I think growing up it was kind of, you know, the provenance of the food, you know, you would go and you'd kind of touch everything, smell everything, you know, it was mm-hmm. like, and you'd have sort of this almost like discussion with the fishmonger about, you know, what, you know, what are the freshest, the best, you know, and it's all about the the, the raw ingredients. And I think also my mum, um, she always put a bowl of salad on the table, regardless of what we were having, whether it was lasagna or soup or fish, right. it was always a bowl. And it was very simple green salad with, oh. you know, whatever we happened to have. But that kind of, you know, it stays with you, doesn't it? Because it's just how, yes. this is what you do. Um, and so, you know, with the kids, I always try to go, you know, you always have to have three, three different colours, you know, breakfast, lunch or dinner, whatever it is. It doesn't, you know, breakfast, it might be an apple and, you know something else but um I do I always try to instill in them you know the rainbow the rainbow you know what colors have you had today and you know I think it's those things that do stick with you anyway um that's kind of how it began and then um my husband had some health problems and um I think that just cemented it in in me and the kind of just realizing that family is kind of just the most important thing and without your family and your health you know what have you really got and so um yeah I think family health does begin with preparing to have the family doesn't it oh yeah that yeah yeah absolutely absolutely and so there is a real well all of that is is fascinating understanding sort of the background of of how somebody has come into this into this more integrative and connected thinking approach to to health and I think there was a sort of really one of the standout things that you've just said is around that the impact that we can have uh, at that sort of stage of when the when the the egg meets the sperm, and also in the the development and the health of of those follicles, which sort of which are continually 
uh, are continually being nurtured, if you like. So what would you say are with your clients or your when you're training, what are the non-negotiable nutrients that you would that you think about for health of sperm health and for follicle for follicle health? So I mean the things that come up no you know they're all important and, and they all work together, don't they? So you can't yes. sort of ignore some. But the things that seem to come up for male fertility is zinc. And, you know, people always say to me, but I take zinc, so I can't be living zinc. But, you know, what we find about zinc is actually the absorption. It's, re it's really, uh, you know, our, our modern life is sort of like not very conducive to actually absorbing some of the minerals that are really important, like zinc and magnesium, partly because of our stress levels and that we don't sit down and actually eat properly. And it's kind of like a vicious circle. So zinc is one of the things that we focus on a lot from our fertility. Antioxidants um omega-3 oils again our modern diet is skewed towards um away from the omega-3 and towards the omega-6 and 9 generally so we want to make sure we've got that balance um so that that would come from oily fish walnuts generally mm -hmm. um and the coq10 again is something that comes up a lot um and that goes for female fertility as well. Vitamin D as well, really, really important. Obviously, everyone's heard about folate, um, but folate is important mainly, I, I think, as a methylation nutrient. So methylation um, is, is an, a process that happens um, inside each cell, but um, the process of conception is quite uh, methylation heavy and folate doesn't work on its own it's part of an you know a, a, an orchestra as it were with the other yeah. b vitamins choline magnesium like so there's um but what what i prefer to ask people to do is eat the dark greasy lean, leafy green vegetables because they come together okay. as they are needed in the body so rather than focusing on specific names of vitamins you know certain vegetables that are, are really good to try and get into the diet every single day. Um, and another like, food source that has all of those nutrients, I think, would be eggs, wouldn't it? Choline, zinc. Eggs, eggs, eat eggs for your eggs. <laughs> That's my <laughs> mantra. I pity those who can't eat eggs because I don't think I could live without eggs. But, yeah, the, the choline is one of the star nutrients, I think, in becoming more and more um you know there's, there's more and more kind of understanding about that as well and liver as well is a brilliant multi nutrient kind of food I mean I know most a lot of people don't like it but um if you do like it then you know have it a couple of times a month because it's 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 such a great food to incorporate um okay and can see. <laughs> great okay um that's interesting that you say about um the a lot of these well, certainly the minerals, which we, for those of you listening to delineate those minerals and uh, vitamins and minerals are, we need in smaller amounts than we do what we call macronutrients. So proteins, mm -hmm. carbohydrates, fats, mm -hmm. mainly because they facilitate hundreds and hundreds of different sort of processes in the body. They're like sort of the, the magic ingredients, if you like, that allows it all to happen. Um, and you mentioned that a lot of these minerals, so zinc, um, magnesium but also some vitamins iron as well they need a certain sort of acidic environment don't they to yeah. be absorbed and so certain lifestyle uh, interventions can inhibit or block that could you sort of explain that to what that the, to the listener a little bit what that means so i'm trying to explain it in a very uh simple way is uh so when so when you eat anything um you know in order to for your body actually to be able to break it down and absorb mm -hmm. it uh you need a, a good level of stomach acid okay. in your in your stomach and that actually helps begin that process of digestion it's the first thing that happens once you've chewed your food and it's gone down and if that if you don't have enough stomach acid that's going to have a knock-on effect on your absorption especially of the minerals but also of the proteins and Perfect. some of the things some of the things that we do in our daily life actually inhibits that um 
production of stomach acid and that mm-hmm. that's stress um illness i guess but also age so as we age naturally that you know that um can can reduce so um but the the uh, the unfortunate thing is that also you need zinc to produce the stomach acid <laughs> so you so you then can end up in a in a sort of vicious circle where you're not getting enough and you're not absorbing enough and so you you know you have to kind of intercept that and so it's not necessarily just about taking more yeah. it's also about focusing on how can you then uh you know lower your stress and make sure that that you know that process is functioning properly um and we you know we we ask people to sort of sit down and eat their food away from their screen and chew their Absolutely. food properly which is quite hard to do i think it is uh in when yeah sort of pre pre covid i was sort of running sort of day retreats and sort of longer retreats and we would sort of we would practice that and actually it it does take practice to actually really engage and chew with chew your food um but for sure it makes such a significant difference so for that sort of the for the fertilization to take place obviously women need to ovulate uh, yeah. So the egg needs to be to be released uh, to let for it to meet meet the sperm, and this is sort of quite a critical part of the menstrual cycle. Mm-hmm. And there can be a number of reasons as to why this doesn't uh, occur as either as optimally or at all. Um, what would you say are the if there were sort of two or three sort of key reasons i mean obviously i don't expect you to go into all of them but what would what would be the top two or three reasons that you you think about or you want to rule in or rule out as Mm -hmm. to why that might not be happening as well as it could be so that's a really good point actually that you made that you know sometimes it's happening or it's not but sometimes it's just not happening as well as it could and Mm -hmm. The thing is, it it's not like everything's great and then one day it falls off a cliff. There's always yeah. a continuum of kind of where are you on this cycle? And it's really important that the ovulation is healthy because once you've popped out that egg, um, what's left is called the corpus luteum. And that um, begins to produce progesterone, which is really, really important um, to have high levels of progesterone in order to actually be able to keep the pregnancy. Okay. And so that's one of the reasons why strong ovulation is really important. And some of the things that can hinder are um, thyroid imbalances. And yeah. it, this could happen even if your levels are, quote unquote, normal, as, you know, according to the doctor's range, uh, reference range, because this, you know, again, if you're on the edge, you know, it might not be optimal. And we're always looking for optimal um, low iron um, can be a factor. One of the major things that comes up time and time again is PCOS, so polycystic ovary syndrome. Yeah, um, that's characterized by a lack of ovulation or very very long cycles. Um, that's a, a hormonal condition which responds extremely well to nutritional therapy, um, and uh, stress is huge. And I know that trying for a baby when it's not happening is stressful. Mm. Uh, we live in a stressful time. Um, I certainly experienced losing my period when my husband was going through his uh, cancer treatment. Um, yes. That that it just disappeared, and you know. But I think that it you know felt like it just disappeared, but clearly it didn't not just disappear. You know, no. there, there was a time up until that point where things were kind of not going great in terms of that, but. Um, that is actually, I always try to um, explain to clients that your body actually, a lot of the time is not malfunctioning. It's actually doing what it's supposed to be doing in the, any given situation. So if that you're was extreme, exactly my thought process when you said that, yeah. Yeah, so it's about your brain and what your brain is sensing. And there's, there's all these feedback loops. Your brain's constantly listening to the hormones and, um, you know, to your breath and to your, you know, or everything that's going on in your body um, is fed back to the brain. And then the brain kind of puts out information to all the different glands and sort of says, well, this is what I want you to do right now. And when you're extremely stressed, um, you know, and that can be 
stress from over exercising as well this yeah. happens when you're over exercise as well um or also when you're when you're underweight yeah um your brain will kind of go okay well now right now is not a good time for us to have a baby so let's just down regulate that bit for now because we need yeah. to focus on other things so your 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 body's doing what it's meant to be doing um and what you need to do is find ways to tell your brain that right now is actually a safe time so you know whatever you can do to look after yourself avoiding over exercising and saying no to things that you don't want to do or that trigger you or um you know maybe taking a break from things that, that are not serving you uh right now mm -hmm. can be really helpful so those are kind of those are the main things yeah, that would that's, hinder ovulation absolutely and that that is so beautifully so beautifully put and presented and and you've explained really really articulately there as always um that stressors to the brain to the master controller that is con that you said that is sensing and you i love the way you said even the breath um as to whether the environment is safe or where it needs to divert energy to to respond and so those stressors uh fall in we're continually as practitioners and guides working around a quadrant or a, a list is but of mm. sort of sections of where those stressors are what is the biggest piece of the pie at that given moment in time mm. so with your when your husband was going through that treatment that was mental and emotional all of those mm. physical chemicals but we're also thinking about if there's infections if there yeah. is metabolic if their blood sugar is dysregulated and so that's sort of a lot of that infections can there's a communication around the gut as well isn't there of, of and that is another area that we work with that can communicate back to that master controller do you do, yeah is that, is that something that you see absolutely yeah infections um kind of grumbling infections or gut infections or an old often an old viral infection that's not kind of been cleared properly um also toxins I mean you know let's not yeah 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 <laughs> um, yeah you know it could be anything but we like you said it's that detective work and work working out you know what he, that person needs and what's the most kind of likely hierarchy of what's the most important thing that's going to move the needle the quickest as well because you know we never have enough time no you I know, know. People want to be pregnant in your world yeah yeah um, I'm interested, Sandra. There was an article in Nature that um, recently read that that was beginning to draw parallels to certainly sort of a, a lack of diversity of the ecosystem that we call the the microbiota or the microbiome that the um, clients might be more familiar with, um, and certain disease states, uh, certain conditions. Um, but also certain an, an overproduction of certain uh, species. So um, is there any, have you seen any papers, any literature on either sort of diversity or lack thereof of the, of the microbiome with being able to become pregnant and fertility? Is there, is there any work in that area? There's loads. There? Uh, we know that women with PCOS and endometriosis can have um a disrupted microbiome so mm. that's part, part, those those are two big groups of women um that we work with but also so the vaginal microbiome which is so e each area of our body you know your eyes have one microbiome yeah. and your vagina has one and your vaginal might there's lots and lots and lots of research now on the vaginal microbiome and the seminal microbiome as well um that links that the that link obviously that's very uh, closely linked to gut the gut microbiome as well so they're very linked they're close together and also um you know whatever's in your gut is going to kind of filter through but um there's lots of studies that where we can sort of see patterns of certain bacteria that are supportive and others that are not um and uh meeting isn't it yeah and also obviously the gut it might not be specifically a study specifically related to fertility but we know that the gut microbiome is involved with neurotransmitter production mm -hmm. um 
you know, produces certain vitamins, certain types of um, acids that are important for our brain, how, you know, this, it's all interconnected in that web of, uh, you know, and it's about learning how to take one piece of information and applying it to a person Mm -hmm. and looking how that, um, but yeah, I think that, um, and isn't it funny how, when we studied, I don't know when you qualified, probably a sort of little, little bit before me, but, you know, if you started talking about the gut function with anybody, they'd kind of like turn away and think, this this woman is crazy. Your gut has nothing to do with yeah. this. And also when I was, uh, it literally was, and in fact, I remember my lecturer saying, oh, just prescribe a probiotic. It was, it was very much about just... Yeah, go as high as you can. Prescribe a probiotic as high as you can, and uh, it'll work. You know, right. literally. I was. Yeah. Just, we've come a long, 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 long way from that. It's funny, actually, because now it's so in the in the public eye. You know, yeah. the, the but also there are doctors, and there are um, certain tests where they look at the end. They actually take a biopsy from the endometrium and look at the the bacterial balance there. Whereas we would just take a swab. We don't, as nutritionists, we don't do kind of those no, sort no, of no. invasive tests. But you can go all the way up to the endometrium and take a, a, a sample. And then, but the outcome is that you get a list of supplements that you can take. And they're all different, all different strains. And it's just like, pick anyone you like. Here's the list. And so the... Gosh. I mean, sometimes there'll be an antibiotic prescribed, but it's it's that kind of um, approach where, oh, well, just take this and, you know, hope for the best. So we're getting there, but I think... We're getting um, there, yeah. And I know you are a, a bigger fan, uh, groupie, well, I won't tarnish you with that, but I am a groupie, of uh, Jason Horolek, who is a fantastic uh australian he lives in tasmania researcher um of the microbiome and really drilling down into the strains and species for in for specific conditions and and to help with side effects um from anything from constipation diarrhea to supporting fertility and i know the likes of you and your your trainees sort of work very much in that very specific area and it's uh, it is a really really exciting time to be in this type of healthcare, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's really exciting. And there's a new um, seminal microbiome test about to come out, which I'm super excited about as well because it just gives us access oh. to so much more, so many more tools. But actually, the vaginal in the UK, Sandra, that yeah. will be available. Yeah, great. Um, the vaginal ecologics test that we do, you know, it's a simple home swab. Um, and we get so much information from that. We're looking at inflammation, bacterial balance, helpful bacteria, unhelpful bacteria. And then we can work with that. And it's, I would say anyone who's struggled, struggled um, with infertility could probably benefit from that. But especially, so with anybody that comes in with miscarriages or mm-hmm. failure to implant um, in terms of IVF, I don't like that term, but that's what it's called. Yeah. Um, that is, or a, that though, those are the people that would always be recommended to have one of those tests, uh, and it's really, really interesting. Um, yeah, it's it's exciting to be able to have those tools now. And I'll, I'll just repeat that name for you. So the test is called the GI Ecologics. Um, and we talked about it on the podcast a couple of weeks ago with Debbie Cotton. Um, and this can be run in conjunction with any of the any of the nutritionists through the Fertility Nutrition Centre, um, which we'll put the details on at the end of the podcast. But it is, um, yeah, it's really, it's really, I mean, I it's really illuminating. And I'm interested that, just you've highlighted there that they also run some inflammatory markers which we know inflammation is is really at the core of dis-ease and I'm not and I and I break that word up not to annoy the listener but (laughs) how I really view this word it's actually as Sandra said earlier on in the conversation we don't just wake up with being not of 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 uh with our menstrual cycles suddenly of not being regular or painless 
Um, similarly, we don't just wake up with a disease. It is a, a continuum of impacts with genetic predisposition that sort of chip away and that event there is a proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back, which causes that moving further away from ease to <laughs> yeah. um, and that inflammation marker um you see that I'm, i'd imagine you get quite excited when you see that because it gives you something really gives you sort of a bit of an aha moment to work with yeah i mean you know there's so many people who have been told that their infertility is unexplained there's no such thing there's no such thing as unexplained infertility there's always more questions that need to be asked but conventional medicine you know i have no i think it's really really important to understand um you know where you're at with you know do you have structural problems or are mm -hmm. there infections or mm -hmm. is there some is there other block tubes you know is there something that's hindering your fertility um you know that can be fixed as it were with the you know medical with the procedure but um you know once all of that has been covered and they don't haven't found anything wrong then you're told that you've got unexplained infertility but you don't you just need to talk to someone who can look further and who can look at your gut look at your stress look take a look at your blood test results from your doctor with a new pair of eyes that's looking for optimal function and looking at patterns we looking look at, at patterns yeah, yeah. Is there inflammation? I mean, that's not some sort of like random buzzword. You know, we there there is mm -hmm. reams of data that shows that inflammation in the pelvic cavity, in the fluid surrounding the pelvic cavity, has an, a, a direct impact on egg health and on, on your fertility. So, you know, for example, if you've got endometriosis, mm -hmm. you know, that's an inflammatory condition. We can't necessarily remove the lesions that you've got, but we can we can put a lid on the inflammation um and th and that's what we're that's what we're kind of aiming to do we don't we're not looking for no inflammation because you know no it's a natural it, process isn't it yeah. we, otherwise we yeah we need we want inflammation to set, help it to save but we that we want that wave of resolution to come in once the inflama inflammatory response has done its job we want yeah. that yeah talking about endometriosis that is interesting is that um there is it's sort of always thought of as being hormonally driven, but really underpinning endometriosis, there is more of, there is sort of an immune dysregulation really, isn't it? That is then sort of exacerbated by sort of, by, by natural, na the natural rhythm of when we have, a, we are in a higher estrogen state over our cycle, but it is more of an, an immune driven kind of dysregulated condition. Yeah, I think I think that working from an in, with a sort of through the, an immune lens and looking at what's going on, I think that really seems to get the best result really with the endometriosis patients. Although nobody really knows for sure no. what it is uh, or why it happens to some people, but I think that you know it's that making sure that your immune system is supported. Uh, you're you 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 haven't got kind of potentially inflammatory foods in your diet we're looking for the anti-inflammatory foods mm -hmm. we're looking for um you know even womb massage and uh, acupuncture can be really helpful and um, partly because i think it helps with the stress surrounding yeah. it because uh, endometriosis is stressful it's painful yeah um and but you know i mean i have it and i think that you know again it responds so well to nutritional therapy and to, to interventions yeah um you may still need to have a procedure to have the lesions removed for in order to get pregnant yeah um but the pain is it's something that we can manage um before and, and after um yeah and making sure also that your hormones aren't going crazy haywire because you know like you said it, it does respond to the horm hormonal fluctuations but some people have more or less you know better balanced hormones for want of a better word <laughs> yeah great that's really really interesting and do you and your team um do you have are there certain sort of ivf clinics that you work that 
that you can work so cohesively with um, that there is sort of a, a a dialogue and an understanding of sort of the benefits of of and the need for both. As yeah. Do you know it's so funny? I used to work with IVF clinics, and they they got I think they got a little bit annoyed because they stopped sending me clients because they would get pregnant without the treatment, and that's not what they wanted. Oh wow. <laughs> okay well <laughs> well because you know it's like oh you've got pcos so here's some drugs and then we'll do this and then we'll do that or or there's male fertility a male fertility factor so let's do ICSI, which is where they inject a sperm mm -hmm. into the egg instead of let, letting the egg and sperm meet naturally but you know we take one step back don't we we fix yeah. we fix we can't fix it all and sometimes no. they still need the treatment but quite often you know, if you can kickstart ovulation, like you said, I mean, that's yeah. step number one, isn't it? And then Absolutely. making sure the egg and the sperm actually meet, which, you know, yeah. if your pH in your vagina is, is too high because you haven't got enough lactobacilli, that sperm and egg are not going to meet because, it, you know, it, the, your mucus is going to be inhospitable. Yeah. Um, you know, if, you, if your sperm's borderline, you know, there's so much that we can do to help make that a better quality but a better swimmer you know and so so a lot of the clinics used to sort of go oh we're not going to send her our clients because we're not getting because ultimately and again I'm not against fertility treatment in any way but I do think and believe that unfortunately it's driven by money mm. and we have to always remember that they are IVF salespeople. yeah um and obviously, I'm a salesperson of nutritional health, but you know, I've I you know, I don't charge somebody ten thousand pounds for a cycle, you know, sure. um, and there, there, there are one or two clinics that I do work with who are a hundred percent on board with what I do. There's a there's a clinical embryologist called Alpesh Doshi who runs a clinic near me in Elstree called IVF London, and. He's so supportive of what we do and he's such a big believer. Um, and his wife is a GP and she is also so wonderful. And, you know, they understand the limitations of the NHS, what happens in a GP office. And, you know, they they have acupuncturists, health coaches, nutritionists kind of on board to bridge that gap where, you know, somebody might need treatment um but at least if they're in the best place possible once they have it you know that that's gonna hopefully yes yeah, absolutely well. um, it's really interesting uh hearing you talking about this this sort of life stage um a couple i've been sort of having a similar conversation about uh, sort of towards sort of the the other side of the life cycle from a woman's perspective around menopause and mm. hrt mm -hmm. and actually the sort of of course the, the thought process is the same is that I'm certainly not HR against HRT at all but it's all about the environment into which you yeah. apply this thought and it's the same with fertility treatment is that you can't expect miracles if the if the, there are depleted nutrients if the blood sugar's off if they're not sleeping properly these are non-negotiable really if we are and that that is true a truly iterative yeah. there is no one magic bullet in terms of yeah. in the same way that you've said there is not unexplained fertility there is you've just got to you've got to keep digging i used to work i used to work with a lot of menopausal ladies and i stopped because i found it so difficult to you know i understand you know you you have to cut, cut down on caffeine and the alcohol and you have to sleep better but actually you're getting your life back because your children are grown up and you want to go out more and have you know yeah, see yeah, your yeah, friends yeah, yeah. and yeah. it's kind of um but you ha you do have to understand that there are some things that you must do and there isn't a pill that's going to undo all of that stuff or make up all, for all of that stuff no no exactly uh, there isn't yeah exactly so and that's and that's actually where maybe we'll sort of finish up on this a client said to me a couple of months ago oh functional medicine that's about running lots of tests isn't it and it made me really sad because um i think i think sometimes that can be um but if it's if it's done well it's about doing minimal testing for <laughs> the the best outcome for the client for the client but yeah. there are some really really helpful tests that we can 
that can inform us. And I think the area of nutrigenomics is yeah. fascinating and can be a real a real leg up in our line of work in terms of how we can then create the right plan in terms of how how um, where the sort of the where the glitches are that we can help navigate that path. Do you know, I feel quite passionate about, te about testing, actually. And I think that, uh, you know, it's it's we have so many incredible tests that you cannot get through conventional m medic medical practitioners and um, that are absolutely amazing but never test for the sake of testing because never. if you go digging you will find something but that something might be a red herring you need to be you know there are some tests that i i do ask everyone to do like a full thyroid panel i.e yep. not just t4 and tsh uh you know we want the antibodies as well um vitamin d you know full blood count and and then there's other tests that are, you know i'd love to have for everybody like a vaginal swab but um, never test for the sake of testing because you will find something that may or may not have been. But the other thing that I always tell my trainees because they're kind of going, oh, what test should I do for this client? I don't know if I should do the Dutch or the Nutraval yeah, yeah. or the this. Or the... And, um, and I say to them, you know, these tests are all lovely. But remember, 12 years ago when I started, most of these tests did not exist. And I was still getting really good results. Like, don't forget the basics. We don't have to do the expensive tests. Um, you know, they're really, really nice to have, but we can get so far without those as well. Yeah. So um, if the, the to takeaway, I mean, there are so many takeaways from this conversation. Love to have you back. But if someone is from, um, from a, a testing point of view in terms of having a full a full what's called a full blood count which your gp can run um you might need to use someone like medichex um or the like of to get a complete thyroid panel but i mean they are i think they're 65 pounds for a full thyroid blood panel and vitamin d mm -hmm. and understanding your blood sugar is 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 really important yeah. but the but uh, certainly sort of working sort of with thyroid health is really important, isn't it? Yeah, you mentioned Medichex. They do uh, a thyroid ultravit. Yes, I think which that is comes really handy. With vitamin D and I think iron. I can't remember exactly, but that one's quite nice. Yeah. And they often have a thyroid Thursday discount. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they do have so, a thyroid Thursday, so yeah. look out for that. Sandra, it's been just such a delight and I'd love to have you back. You've given us so much to think about and uh, clearly you have uh, have educated a fantastic team, which uh, any listener can find at the Fertility Nutrition Centre. All of these yeah. practitioners have been trained by Sandra um and she coaches them and so you will be having sort of the benefit of her wisdom um on your case um and um it's just been fantastic and really enlightening so thank you so much and we'd love to have you back um and also to an event uh soon so thank you so much and we will see you on another episode hopefully thank you for having me you're welcome, welcome.